Good morning, boys and girls. I hope you are well today. Uh, the first thing I'm going to read is just one story from a book of stories about athletes. And it's the, a little bit of a biography, a short biography of various athletes. So the first one I'm going to read is about Maureen Conley, who was a great American tennis player. She was the first woman in history to win all of the world's major tennis tournaments. Now, there aren't many pictures here, as you can see, so I'm going to just sit like this. Once her mother finally obliged her requests for a $1.50 racket, tennis became the focus of Maureen Connolly's life. Six years later, at age 16, she became the youngest champion of women's tennis in the United States, and after that lost only four matches during the rest of her career. Three years in a row, she was voted Female Athlete of the Year by sports writers, and then at 19, she won the Grand Slam, all four major international tournaments, Wimbledon, the French Open, the Australia Open, and the U.S. Open, the first woman to do so. Connolly, known invariably as Little Mo because of her height, she was five foot three inches, that's pretty tiny, and she sacrificed a normal teen life to tennis. She fit her schoolwork in between practice and travel and attended no proms or after-school activities. Instead, she attended the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, met the Pope, and he asked her about tennis. She played tennis with Hollywood stars, went surfing in Hawaii, strolled the sidewalks of Paris, visited Aztec monuments in Mexico, and asked soon-to-be president Dwight Eisenhower, what did you have for breakfast? Connolly had two personalities. Off court, she was sweet, bubbly, and popular with crowds. She was generous in praise of others, tending to credit Irish luck for her own success. On court, her face became tightly drawn. She was a fierce, deadly competitor. Privately, she acknowledged a hatred of her opponents, combined with a fear of losing. The tennis court became my secret jungle, and I, I was a lonely, fear-stricken hunter. She said, I was a strange girl, armed with hate, fear, and a golden racket. Conley wore white cotton or shark skin tennis dresses especially designed for her. Her favorite was a fanciful creation of woolly poodles, each with a rhinestone eye running across it in the front. She always wore two good luck charms, a heart-shaped locket bracelet from her mother and a ring in the shape of two dragons guarding a ball. To replenish her energy during games, she sucked sugar, she sucked sugar lumps and sipped hot tea with lemon. It's a lot different from Gatorade, isn't it? Off, off the court, she liked steak, hamburgers, and big salads. To improve her footwork, she took up ballet, tap dancing, and skipping rope in what she called a red hot pepper way. She wrote a column called Letters from Little Mo for a newspaper and later did articles for magazines, in part to help pay for her tennis expenses. She was not a good public speaker. Conley tended to talk fast under normal circumstances, and when she had stage fright, she sounded like a machine gun. The second most important activity in Connolly's life was riding horses. After the glittering parade San Diego held when she returned as the top woman tennis player in the world, the Chamber of Commerce presented her with her own horse, Colonel Mary Boy, her dearest wish come true. A year later, the horse panicked and threw her into an approaching cement mixing truck, crushing her right leg. Six weeks after the accident, she was cautiously back on court but the injury was more serious than she had thought, and within months, she announced her retirement. The first time she had ever played tennis with Norman Brinker, once a member of the Olympic equestrian team, children on the sidelines had called out their sympathy for him. Conley and Brinker went on to marry, and she taught tennis to people of all ages, wrote books on tennis, and had two children. Conley was excited about living in the center court of Babyland, but she died young of 34 of cancer. Uh, early in her career, Conley sometimes lost her temper on court, glaring at officials, hurling balls, and even throwing her racket. In the shower after one such display at the age of 14, she told herself that unless she could control her anger, she would have no future. All her temper did was bolster her opponent's confidence. She never lost it on the court again, and in fact, her coach called her the best sportsman in tennis. In 1952, in London for the first time, Conley was nervous and scared. Her stormy relationship with the coach had ended bitterly. 
She was being treated for a painful shoulder condition. Journalists hounded her day and night. And with the weight of American pride on her shoulders, the match was not going well. The crowd was tense and silent. When suddenly, a young man from the United States Air Force yelled encouragement. Conley took strength from that and then went on to become the second youngest winner in Wimbledon history. So she had a pretty uh, exciting life. Unfortunately, it was short, but it was interesting. So she was one of the best women tennis players we, the United States has ever had. So that's that story. The next one is a little less serious. This is called Stella Luna by Janelle Cannon. In a warm and sultry forest far, far away, there once lived a mother fruit bat and her new baby. Oh, how mother bat loved her tiny, soft baby. I'll name you Stella Luna, she crooned. Each night, mother bat would carry Stella Luna clutched to her breast as she flew out to search for food. So there's Stella Luna clutched and mother bat. One night, as mother bat followed the heavy scent of ripe fruit, an owl spied her. On silent wings, the powerful bird swooped down upon the bats. Dodging and shrieking, Mother Bat tried to escape, but the owl struck again and again, knocking Stella Luna into the air. Her baby wings were as limp and useless as wet paper. Down, down, down she went, faster and faster, into the forest below. Oh no. The dark, leafy tangle of branches caught Stella Luna as she fell. One twig was small enough for Stella Luna's tiny feet. Wrapping her wings about her, she clutched the thin branch, trembling with cold and fear. Mother, Stella Luna squeaked, where are you? By daybreak, the baby bat could hold on no longer. Down, down again, she dropped. Flump! Stella Luna landed headfirst into a soft, downy nest, startling the three baby birds who lived there. Stella Luna quickly clambered from the nest and hung out of sight below it. She listened to the babble of the three birds. What was that? cried Flap. I don't know, but it's hanging by its feet, chirped Flitter. Shh, here comes Mama, hissed Pip. Many, many times that day, Mama Bird flew away, always returning with food for her babies. Stella Luna was terribly hungry, but not for the crawly things that Mama Bird bought. Finally, though, the little bat could bear it no longer. She climbed into the nest, closed her eyes, and opened her mouth. Plop! In dropped a big green grasshopper. Stella Luna learned to be like the little birds. She stayed awake all day and slept all night. She ate bugs even though they tasted awful. Her bat ways were quickly disappearing except for one thing. Stella Luna liked to sleep hanging by her feet. Once, when Mama was away, the curious baby birds decided to try it too. When Mama Bird came home, she saw eight tiny feet gripping the edge of the nest. Eek! she cried. Get back up here this instant. You're going to fall and break your necks. The birds clambered back into the nest, but Mama Bird stopped Stella Luna. You are teaching my children to do bad things. I will not let you back into this nest unless you promise to obey all the rules of this house. Stella Luna promised. She ate bugs without making faces, she slept in the nest at night, and she didn't hang by her feet. Stella Luna behaved as a good bird should. All the babies grew quickly. Soon the nest became crowded. Mama Bird told them it was time to learn to fly. One by one, Pip, Flitter, Flap, and Stella Luna jumped from the nest. Their wings worked. I'm just like them, thought Stella Luna. I can fly too. Pip. Flitter and Flap landed gracefully on a branch. Stella Luna tried to do the same. How embarrassing! She's flipping around the branch. She just can't do it. I will fly all day, Stella Luna told herself. Then no one can see how clumsy I am. If I don't land, they can't tell. The next day, Pip, Flitter, Flap, and Stella Luna went flying far from home. They flew for hours, exercising their new wings. The sun is setting, warned Flitter. We had better go home or we will get lost in the dark, said Flap. But Stella Luna had flown far ahead and was nowhere to be seen. The three anxious birds went home without her. 
All alone, Stella Luna flew and flew until her wings ached and she dropped into a tree. I promise not to hang by my feet, Stella Luna said. So she hung by her thumbs and soon fell asleep. She didn't hear the sound of soft wings coming nearer. Hey, a loud voice said. Why are you hanging upside down? Stella Luna's eyes wa opened wide. She saw a most peculiar face. I'm not upside down, you are, said Stella Luna. Ah, but you're a bat, and bats hang by their feet. You are hanging by your thumbs, so that makes you upside down, said the creature. I'm a bat, I'm hanging by my feet. That makes me right side up. Stella Luna was confused. Mama Bird told me I was upside down. She said I was wrong. Well, wrong for a bird maybe, but not for a bat. More bats gathered around to see the strange young bat who behaved like a bird. Stella Luna told them her story. You ate b -b -b bugs stuttered one. You slept at night, they gasped. How very strange, they all murmured. Wait, wait, let me look at this child, a bat pushed through the crowd. An owl attacked you, she asked. Sniffing Stella Luna's fur, she whispered, You are Stella Luna. You're my baby. You escaped the owl, cried Stella Luna. You survived? Yes, Mother Bat said as she wrapped her wings around Stella Luna. Come with me and I'll show you where to find the most delicious fruit. You'll never have to eat another bug as long as you live. But it's nighttime, Stella Luna squeaked. We can't fly in the dark or we will crash into trees. We're bats, said Mother Bat. We can see in the darkness. Come with us. Stella Luna was afraid, but she let go of the tree and dropped into the deep blue sky. Stella Luna could see. She felt as though rays of light shone from her eyes. She was able to see everything in her path. Soon the bats found a mango tree, and Stella Luna ate as much of the fruit as she could hold. I'll never eat another bug as long as I live, cheered Stella Luna as she stuffed herself full. I must tell Pip, Flitter, and Flap. The next day, Stella Luna went to visit the birds. Come with me and meet my bat family, said Stella Luna. Okay, let's go, agreed Pip. They hang by their feet and they fly at night and they eat the best food in the whole world, Stella Luna explained to the birds along the way. As the birds flew among the bats, Flap said, I feel upside down here. So the birds hung by their feet. Wait until dark, Stella Luna said. We will fly at night. When night came, Stella Luna flew away. Pip flitter and flap leapt from the tree to follow her i can't see a thing yelled pip neither can i howled flitter ah shrieked flap they're going to crash gasped stella luna i must rescue them stella luna swooped about grabbing her friends in the air she lifted them to a tree and the birds grasped a branch stella luna hung from above and held on to them we're safe said stella luna and then she sighed I wish you could see in the dark, too. We wish you could land on your feet, Flitter replied. Pip and Flap nodded. They perched in silence for a long time. How can we be so different and feel so much alike, mused Flitter. And how can we feel so different and be so much alike, wondered Pip. I think this is quite a mystery, Flap chirped. I agree, said Stella Luna, but we're friends, and that's a fact. The end. Well, that was a good story. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Have a great day, and I'll see you soon.